All right, everybody, so we're going to be starting off with covering all the tools and supplies that you'll be needing for making your Stormtrooper or building your Stormtrooper armor. Um, and some of these are obviously tools that are going to be used to in the actual construction, and some kind of gets into support materials that you're going to need. So uh, first and foremost is, of course, safety, right? So, um, you know, make sure you're using safety glasses and safety goggles. Um, you're going to be doing lots of drilling and cutting and grinding. So, um, you know, whether you're using a face shield or just regular goggles, super, super important. Um, gloves. So um, in general, you don't want to use gloves with power tools, but when you're working with adhesives and things like that, uh, making sure that you got gloves on, paints, that kind of stuff um, definitely helps. So I'm just wearing these uh, black rubber gloves for some hand modeling today. Um, and then really importantly is a respirator. Um, I know a lot of people try to get away with like a dust mask, but a good quality um, uh, respirator that meets the standards for fumes and, and particle matter, uh, both of those items are really important because you're going to be dealing with lots of glues and solvents. So um, we're going to start on one side and kind of work our way all the way down here. Um, in the construction of the armor, obviously you're going to be taping armor parts together and then gluing them and clamping them. So um, I like to get, or I like to use a variety of clamps. Um, these are sort of woodworking clamps. They're sometimes called bar clamps. Um, they're great. You just press this button and you can slide it to whatever size you want. And then you squeeze this handle and then they clamp down. So uh, they're normally used for gluing pieces of wood together, but obviously in our case, um, these work fantastic for armor. So I generally use like a, a medium and a small size, um, and they're fairly cheap. I've gotten these ones on sale for like, you know, two or three dollars, um, and the bigger ones are a little bit more, right? But um, it's good to have both sizes, and uh, they're not all shown here, but um, I've got like four of everything, because I like to work on, you know, at least sort of two limbs at the same time so that they can cure and then I can kind of work on other parts afterwards. So um, if you can, try to get four of everything. That's going to really help. So um, I, la I use uh, four of the small ones and four of the big ones a lot. Um, if you can't find those, you can also use these um, traditional kind of spring clamps. Um, these work great. They have a deeper reach here than the bar clamp, so they reach a little bit further in. Um, I like these uh, to use these sometimes, but um, other times when you're trying to get into small areas, especially when you're gluing the armor halves together, the this mouth here it gets really wide and it kind of takes up a lot of space. Um, and a lot of times when you get these, they come in sets anyway, so you kind of end up with like a small, medium, or large. Um, the head is still quite big. Uh, the clamping area is quite big on these medium ones. So. Um, and then the smaller you go, the less strength it has. So depending on the armor piece that you're working on, um, I, I like using these, but um, I, I still like to use the bar clamps where possible. But it's kind of one of those things of, you know, use whatever you can get in your region. Um, over here, we've got a hot glue gun. I'm not actually assembling any armor with the hot glue gun. This is only going to be used for um, webbing and elastics and that sort of thing. Um, when we get to the actual assembly, I'll show you why I use this. But I like to double the elastic over and, and hot glue it together um, to make like a really, really solid base for the snaps to go through. So um, if you're going to be doing any kind of costume making or crafting, a hot glue gun is uh, indispensable, right? It's something you're going to be using for a very, very long time. Um, a hole punch um, or a leather punch. Um, this one's adjustable so that you can uh, punch different sizes of holes. Um, and it's primarily used for punching holes in like leather belts and that kind of thing. But um, you can get this kind, which is like a pair of pliers. You just put your item in there and then punch through like that. Um, you can also get a kind where you use like a hammer um, and then it's got like interchangeable ends on it and you can actually like hammer it down. Um, either kind will work. Um, whatever you can find uh, is probably suitable, as long as you make sure that you've got different sizes so that you can accommodate um, the different holes that you might need to punch in some of the different elastic uh, or, or webbing materials. Um, I'm just going to finish off some of the kind of the hard tools first. Uh, drill. So it doesn't matter if it's corded or electric. Um, you're probably going to need like a one eighth inch bit, if not a couple other sizes, but uh, super handy to have. Um, variable speed is nice too, so that you can use a slower speed for um, thinner plastic so you don't chew through it quite as fast. Um, but you're definitely going to need a drill for, for drilling holes. Uh, hammer for setting um, snaps, which we'll get to in a little bit, but any old hammer will do. 
Um, you're going to need a rivet gun for the uh, assembling the helmet. Uh, back in the day, other parts of the armor, like the thigh ammo strip and the, the knee plate, used to be riveted on. But nowadays, for more accuracy, they use um, these sort of like cap rivets. But you still use this for the helmet um, along the sides. Uh, the, where you, when you assemble the helmet um, and then the ears go on top, they'll hide the rivets. But um, just a standard kind of pop rivet gun. Most of them come with different sizes of uh, the, the little adapters here. Um, and I tend to use um, these 1 8 inch uh, diameter rivets. Um, and, and they'll say that they're one eighth of an inch long. Um, sometimes I'll use one eighth. Sometimes I'll use one quarter of an inch. Uh, but you can get these in a really, you know, handy pack. Um, and you definitely want to get the backing washers too. You don't ever want to rivet anything um, through, you know, joining two pieces of plastic together or metal for for that matter, um, without putting a backing washer on the other side. What'll happen is. Um, if you just use the rivet by itself, it'll pull out eventually, um, or it potentially can pull out. So by putting a backing rivet and sandwiching the two pieces that you want to rivet together, um, this will expand on this end and it'll basically compress um, those two layers together. And it almost never fails. So uh, make sure you get, if you're getting 1 8 inch rivets, um, get um, 1 8 inch uh, backing washers as well too. Um, finishing off some of the tools, uh, you want a uh, hobby blade or an exacto blade. I like to use both sizes, so I like to use this bigger one um, for cutting, uh, you know, using the metal ruler to cut along um, strips of plastics for cover strips and that sort of thing. Sometimes I use the smaller one for more detailed cuts. Um, I generally try not to get the, the sort of utility carpet cutting kind that just has you know that sort of one trapezoid shaped blade that sticks out because you always have to go buy new blades these ones you can just um, snap off the ends when you want a, a fresh uh, blade right so you can snap them off in sort of half inch increments and these ones are nice just for for cutting smaller items so I like to have both of those on hand um, moving right along one of the primary items for trimming out armor is Lexan scissors so these you can buy at um, hobby shops that sell supplies for like RC cars and planes and that sort of thing. And these were originally designed for cutting out um, clear, uh, you know, race car bodies like along the wheel wells and that kind of stuff. So you can get them in a curved uh, blade like this or you can get them in a straight one as well too. And a lot of people think, okay, well, you know, they're such tiny scissors. How are they going to have the strength to, to cut through, you know, this thick armor plastic? But the whole point is that these are really long on the handle end, so there's a lot of leverage, and then there's a smaller blade. So um, it just, like, it just chews through plastic like nobody's business. So um, it's a good idea to try to keep them sharp as well, too, and so sometimes I'll use a Dremel sharpening um, wheel and, and just sharpen that up. But uh, they last a really, really long time. I've used this pair for... I think seven years and, and it's still going good. Um, and I have a backup one just in case. Sometimes people want to borrow them and that sort of thing. Uh, another tool that um, I use uh, sometimes, actually mostly just for the helmet primarily, is a Dremel. Um, a lot of people think, well, you know, I need to get a Dremel with a cutoff wheel to cut every single piece of plastic. And that's not the case. I actually don't like to do that because um, it makes a mess. Uh, the smell of burning plastic is awful. Um, and you sure don't want to be like, you know, trimming a thigh or something and then slip and make a mistake and, and make a, a gouge that, that's, uh, you know, not, not going to be very easy to repair. So I primarily use the Dremel for um, uh, cutting out like the eye hole areas on the helmet and, or the teeth. Um, and then to do that, kind of the most popular bits that I'll use, um, I'll use like a diamond um, cutoff wheel, which is a really, really thin one. It's a little bit different than the carbon or whatever these are called. I think they're like fiberglass reinforced uh, cutting wheels. They both can work. Um, these ones are, they cut a little bit thicker and they cause a lot of kind of, um, you know, particulate matter to, to come flying out and the wheel wears down really, really fast. Um, so just be aware of that if you buy these and always, always wear your safety glasses because these can shatter as well too. This thin one is like a diamond uh, tipped wheel. Now it's quite expensive. Um, I, I can't remember the exact price of it, but it was like 20 some odd dollars or something. And um, But they're really nice. They last a long time. They don't um, cause as much uh, particles of plastic to come flying out, so it's potentially a good investment. Um, but I mainly only use that to cut out um, the eye holes on the helmet. Um, and then the other two bits that I'll use a lot are these two sanding drums. You can get different um, 
sort of grits of, of sandpaper that go on the ends. And then the last one I'll use sometimes is like this sort of um, metal bit for, for cutting out the teeth, for getting right in there. Um, that comes in uh, super, super handy. Um, Moving on to the next tool, uh, a lighter um, or some matches, whatever. You can use this to just sort of seal the ends of um, elastic or uh, webbing so that they don't fray. So that's really important to have. Obviously, be really careful with this when you're using any of your adhesives and, and flammable type stuff. Um, and just a regular pair of scissors for cutting the elastic and just other materials that you might have. Um, really good sharp pair of scissors. Don't use fabric scissors. That's like a big no-no in the craft world. Um, and then a steel ruler. This is uh, really important. So try to find one that's going to have um, standard size uh, in inches and metric as well too because sometimes there's different measurements that you're going to want to follow. And steel is really important. You don't want to ever want to use a plastic ruler when you're um, using that as a guide to, to cut plastic. Um, and then sort of the last thing kind of in the tool end is um, uh, or you know, I guess hardware related is uh, rare earth magnets. So I'll use these along the middle seams of um, armor limbs and that kind of stuff. So these particular ones are three quarter inch wide, um, and they're I don't know a little over an eighth of an inch thick. I usually double them up just to make them that much stronger. Um, and you can get these in a variety of places. Um, and I'd recommend getting at least twenty magnets to if you're going to be uh, building uh, stormtrooper armor quite a bit. Um, if they if they're a little bit out of your price range, they they really don't cost that much. But I mean, if you don't think you're ever going to use them again, maybe partner up with another person that's going to be building armor and um, see if you can kind of share the cost with them. So uh, moving on to kind of other supplies that you might need, we talked about the one eighth inch rivets and the rivet gun. Um, the original armor used um, for the torso, anyways, used wire brackets. Um, and and what this was was when when you had a piece like the chest. Let's pretend the chest was like over here and then the abdomen was over here. They had these wire brackets that would be um, screwed into the, uh, bolted actually, into the, the return edge. And then there'd be a loop of elastic to join it together. And um, I guess, you know, back in the day, that's, that's kind of the fastening method that they used. So if you look on the original armor along the bottom of the chest, you'll actually see like a series of holes where these... Um, uh, wire brackets were. Now if you want to go and, and you know do that and replicate that original method you absolutely can. You could make your own wire brackets. There's also um, sort of hobbyists and makers that sell them as well too. Um, some people don't necessarily want to go that far. Um, back in the day people would just use Velcro to join, you know, two halves of uh, the armor together, or not the two halves, excuse me, but like, you know, the two components, like a chest and an abdomen. But the problem is that when you use Velcro, it has like no give to it whatsoever. So as you're moving around, it would tend to, to give out. Um, and so uh, several years back, people kind of came up with the idea of like, okay, well, what if you used elastic and made um, snap plates? So snap plates are basically just little squares of plastic with a a male um, rivet, uh, pop, or sorry, not a popper, like a snap rivet uh, on one side, and then your strapping has the female side, and then when you want to join that together, you just pop that down, and then now you have a connection. These would be glued to the opposite sides of the armor, and then this allows a little bit of movement like this, and then it allows a bit of stretch too. Um, you know, you could go, uh, you know, a different way and take a piece of elastic and sew Velcro on, but it's pretty fast to make these snap plates. So I've got a separate video that I'll, I'll link in the in the show notes on how to make snap plates. Um, but this has become a, a fairly, you know, popular method for kind of like a, a really troopable way to assemble your armor. So to do that, um, we use um, the snaps. And so the ones that I use are Tandy Line 24 snaps. So this is the head for the female side, which is here, right? So this is the side that's going to snap on to sort of the, the male side. And then this is the base for the, um, the female side. And then it just looks like that, right? So um, you can get these in packages of 10, um, and you probably want you know, between 20 and 30 of them if you're making a, a set of armor. I buy these in big batches and of 100, so I always have them around. Um, but I go through these like crazy. Um, the other benefit is that um, 
you can use, um, you know, if you have ones like this that's got this sort of, you know, ridge detail on it, that's an actual exposed rivet that's seen um, on, the, on the right side of the abdomen. So um, it's nice to get a few sets of these in silver if you can. I just sometimes get them in different, you know, whatever colors available because most of the time this is inside the armor and you're not really going to see it. Um, but get a few sets of those. Um, and, that, and that'll basically, you know, it's for the strapping, uh, elastic strapping for the entire suit. Um, most of it's going to be in the torso, but you can use it in a few other areas as well, too. And when you get them in the sets of 10, um, they'll come with a, a setting tool, right? So what happens is when you want to set your, um, your, your snap, you're going to have it sitting like this. You're going to have your um, elastic um, and then you're going to punch a hole in that and then it's going to go over and you'll see this exposed head and then you're going to put your um, oh god this one you're going to put that on top of it and then you're going to use the setting tool and then you're going to put that in there and then you're going to hammer on it gently and it'll mushroom out the head um, and then that'll make it super secure. It's not going to come apart again. So um, if you buy them in packs of 10 uh, from Tandy, they come with a setting tool. If not, you get them separately and they don't cost very much. Um, some other sort of uh, rivets and things that you're going to need. These are split rivets. This one's gold, but um, you'll need some silver ones for the side of the abdomen. So I think you need uh, six for the side uh, of the abdomen. You'll need two for the thigh ammo strip and one for the cod piece. Um, the butt uses two um, exposed uh, snap heads, um, like the silver one that I, I showed you earlier, like that. Um, but these are a little bit harder to find. Um, you can find sellers on white armor that sell them. And basically, same thing. You've got a hole in your armor. You've got a hole in your elastic. You're going to put this through, put a washer on the on the back end of it, and then you're going to you know, use a screwdriver or whatever to flare out this end and fold the sides over, and that's why they call them split rivets. But you're going to need a few of those um, to go along with your, your kit. You're also going to need um, a few of these cap rivets or double cap rivets. So same thing like on the on the thigh strip, thigh ammo strip, you're going to drill a hole through the thigh ammo strip and the thigh, and then you're going to uh, put these through the hole and put them together like so and then you're going to lay it on a flat surface and hammer them uh, together and that's what um, was seen on the on the side of the, uh, the thigh ammo strip so you'll need a few of those as well too. Um, moving right along and since we've started kind of on the rivets side of things um, to the elastic um, you'll need a variety of elastic for the entire uh, armor uh, probably one of the most common ones if you are using the snap plate method. Um, uh, I like to use one and a half inch wide uh, black el elastic fabric. Um, you're probably going to need like four meters of that or about four yards of that. Um, so I get them in big rolls because I use these for other things all the time. But um, that's a size that I, I commonly use a lot. Um, you're also probably going to need um, kind of one and a half to two inch um, elastic for the shoulder connection between the chest armor and the back armor at the very top um, and that's you know going to be white elastic you'll also need some um, you know one inch um, for the uh, sides of the armor on the left side of the abdomen where the um, split rivets go on the left side uh, so you can use one inch or one and a half you know no one really sees it but um, it's nice to have the one inch size um, and then same for the um, around the base of the uh, shoulder bells. Um, you can kind of use anything sort of between three quarter and one inch. Um, I, again, it, it kind of depends on what's available in your area. Um, in some countries it's going to be metric sizes, in some countries it's going to be standard sizes. Um, and there'll be a link in the show notes to um, the specifications for some of the elastics that are required. Um, you'll also need some uh, one inch white elastic, you can see in the corner there, for um, the drop boxes, attaching the drop boxes to the belt. And then um, I do sometimes use like a, a wider elastic, like a two or two and a half inch for making garters. So that'd be like a belt that goes around your waist. And then you have this wider elastic that goes down into each thigh. And you can glue that into place or Velcro it, whatever you like. But that basically holds up the thigh. Um, so that's kind of it for the snaps and elastic side of things. Um, some other sort of materials that you'll need, you'll probably want some Velcro for um, your uh, the backs of your shins or calf closures. The original armor, um, I don't have any uh, of these, but um, they used bra hooks. So one side of the 
calf or the back of the shin had holes in it and then the other side had white elastics with bra hooks and they would they would fit into those holes um, and that's fine if you want to go that way um, for the majority of my builds I just use adhesive velcro um, on, on both sides of the uh, the calves um, and you can get two different types of velcro right you can kind of get um, you know regular adhesive velcro and it's got this sort of the standard um, hook on it um, and then you can also get this kind which is just um, it's called heavy-duty velcro um, and you can see the hook pattern is different on there and it's not very tall but um, it's super tenacious in terms of the grab um, and I'll show you some tricks in terms of how to get a really good adhesion onto whatever you're going to be using it for um, but um, yes you will need some velcro and white would probably be a good color to get for the velcro um, we're starting to move into some other tools. I'm going to try to move this way so that I don't forget anything. Um, we're going to get into adhesives. So um, the adhesive that I tend to use the most for armor builds is E6000. Um, not sure which way this video is going to be, but E6000 cement. Um, it is a contact cement, so you're going to spread it on one surface and the other surface on the other piece, you're going to let it tack up for a couple minutes and then you're going to join them together and then clamp them, hence the need for all the clamps. Um, this Using this adhesive is uh, a little bit easier uh, for, for new builders because you can kind of shift things around and move it around and you've got a little bit of work time with it and then it doesn't really sort of bond together and hold for like a, you know an hour or two uh, and you generally leave it overnight or 24 hours for full strength um, and then the benefit of it is it's very resilient so even when you've got two pieces that are joined together you can really like try and work them apart and they're never really going to come apart but if you ever really wanted to like if you wanted to make the thigh pieces bigger or the calf bigger or something like that you could heat up the um, edge with a, a heat gun you're basically heating up the adhesive and then you could force a chisel down the middle and then separate the halves when you're using other types of adhesives like um, um, solvents basically that that bond that basically melt the two plastics together um, the, you're not going to have that that ability to separate them um, so some of the other uh, adhesives that I use um, very very sparingly um, just for kind of small areas I might use like a uh, a plastic weld um, which is like an ABS um, cement it's very runny very liquidy um, and you have very little work time it's like seconds um, so you really have to work very very fast to get them together um, this is a, um, a side grip which is like a weld on um, 16 is uh, uh, kind of what it's commonly known as it's normally meant for acrylics but it will work for ABS uh, and styrene plastic and it kind of it comes out a little bit more like a honey sort of um, consistency um, so that sometimes I'll be using I'll use that as well um, I generally try to avoid kind of this typical um, uh, you know plumbing cement the yellow cement I mean it's not a big deal if you're using it for the odd snap plate here and there but um, same thing you have to work fairly fast and then of course it's yellow so it's not a big deal if it's a, an area that you don't notice but generally try to avoid that the vast majority of the armor uses E6000 um, and I do not really like to use um, CA glue uh, which is like super glue or Zappa gap or any of those types of glues um, these are great for building models but they are not very resilient so when you're joining armor halves together yeah it'll hold it together but I mean you're putting so much stress and strain on them they don't have kind of like the little bit of give that the E6000 does so I generally try not to use that type of, of adhesive um, of course having um, some uh, you know popsicle sticks or something like that to spread the adhesives this is super handy because you can tape it together to make like little wood shims or something if you need to to, to fill up gaps before you clamp things together um, I also sort of try and just save like any sort of scrap plastic that's around for spreading um, uh, adhesive as well too that's super super handy um, moving on down the bench here uh, pencils um, you're gonna have to draw lines on plastic and things like that right so if you use um, an HB pencil it's not really going to leave a mark so I like to use like a softer pencil like a 5B or something like that um, use that a lot and I don't worry about it being on the plastic you can just use some rubbing alcohol on a cloth and it'll pretty much take that right off um, we're going to move on to um, paints. Well, actually, sandpaper. Let's do that first. You're going to need some sandpaper uh, for sanding the edges of the armor down. 
if you need to reshape things and fine-tune things. So um, I generally kind of have like 150 or 180 grit um, or even like 200 grit is as fine as, as I sort of use for armor construction. Um, if you're doing kind of repairs or you scratch something, of course you need to go finer and finer, but for kind of just sanding parts um, before you're about to glue them and sanding the edges of stuff to take the sharp corners off, I find like a 180 grit or something like that works fine. Um, having a sanding block really helps, so when you're you want to just you know take off a sharp corner or something um, that's really really effective um, or you can use like these um, foam uh, back sanding blocks this one's quite a bit harder than some of the other ones um, but this is a, a good one to use too um, and yeah same thing you want to make sure you're wearing a mask because you can kind of see all the particles that it starts to uh, stir up um, also in terms of like sanding, um, you probably want a small file when you're working on the helmet and you're actually filing, uh, you know, the slots for the teeth. You might have drilled the holes for the teeth or you might have used a Dremel to open that up, but you want to square up the edges with a file. If you don't want to go out and buy a bunch of small ones like this, a really old school modeling hack is to take a popsicle stick and then just glue some sandpaper to it. So you're essentially making your own file um, in whatever size that you want. And and then you can just, right, still works great. So you can use that um, in small pieces like this, or you can, you know, glue them for onto flat pieces of plastic or a little piece of wood or something to make your own sanding block. So that's kind of a cheap way around things. Um, paints. When you're starting to paint your helmet, um, you're going to need paints and paint brushes. So um, the most common colors that you're going to need are, are the blue and the gray. Um, and you can use um, enamels, that's what most people use. So you can use humbrols, um, or you can use testers, or you can use Model Master, which is another sort of testers brand. So you'll need the blue. Um, uh, I believe it's a French blue uh, that most people use. Um, and then the gray, in the testers anyways, it's, it's like a 1138 gray, which I thought was kind of cool because it's THX1138. There it is right there. You'll also need black um, for uh, the vocoder area. Um, and then you'll also need white to paint over any kind of exposed rivets like the thigh ammo strip and uh, the side, the split rivets on the side of the, the abdomen. So you want to get a few paints there. For brushes, um, I usually get a, or use a few different brushes. I use this round flat one for the vocoder because it tends to make that nice round shape at the top of the vocoder. fills in really easily. Um, in terms of flat brushes, I've got a really small one. It's only about uh, an eighth of an inch wide. And then this one over here is maybe three eighths of an inch wide. So that's for filling. If you were going to be hand painting areas, um, on the helmet, like the, the traps and that sort of thing, you want to block in color, this would be a good one to use. Um, and in, in terms of um, when I'm doing um, ab buttons and that sort of thing, I'll draw a pencil line and then I'll actually use this one and just kind of go around. I know that might be a little bit hard for um, you know people that might not be accustomed to it, um, but this is a good one too to do ab buttons because it's got a round shape to the end. And then when you're doing any of the thin um, you know, outlines or things like that, I use a different technique. I actually paint the black first and then do the gray um, and kind of cut in the, um, the shape. Um, but when you need to do um, the striping lines uh, for the vents to simulate the vents, you're going to need a small round brush, right? So you're going to need one of those as well too. And then to clean your brushes, you're going to need um, some sort of thinner um, for cleaning these oil-based paints. And uh, I forgot this a little bit earlier, but blue masking tape. This stuff is awesome. You don't really want to use kind of the white masking tape because it's really, really sticky and it's hard to peel off. This uh, blue stuff, it tends to hold really well and it peels off very easily too. Um, I try to avoid using the green um, sort of frog tapes, that sort of thing, because they have a very, very low tack um, and uh, they don't have as much hold to them. Um, I think that covers everything sort of tool-wise that we have here. Um, I think the only thing I don't didn't show, I ran out of you know bench space actually, is a heat gun. So um, sometimes you will need a heat gun for uh, heating up certain pieces if you need to kind of mold them or reshape them a little bit. Um, it's not absolutely required, but it definitely comes in handy for a few of the areas. If you don't have one, you can borrow one too, because you're probably not really going to use it that much. But um, that's about it. So I hope that's helpful in terms of the tools that you need um, for putting together your armor. Oh, sorry, I forgot. Paper towels. 
cleaning messes up, cleaning brushes, cleaning glue. Um, you're probably also going to have your thermal detonator clips. Um, you're going to need some uh, round head screws that are going to go into those as well too. Um, they're slotted round head screws if, and they're, they're black. Um, which I found was actually really, really hard to find. So most people just paint their uh, round head screws black. Um, but there you go. Uh, I think I've covered everything this time. So uh, if I missed anything, you'll probably see it in some of the armor tutorials. But uh, anyways, I hope that helps you to get started. Um, I know that's sort of intimidating to see all this stuff, but um, it might be good to partner up with somebody or find someone you know in your local uh, 501st garrison or something like that that might be working on armor as well too and you can kind of split the cost of supplies so that'll help you uh, make things go a little bit easier on your wallet alright so good luck